Greetings, everybody. Get your King James Bible and turn to Luke chapter 14. This Bible study is going to be called Counting the Cost. Counting the Cost. The cost of what? Following Jesus. Verse 1. Luke 14, verse 1. And it came to pass, as he, Jesus, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. Now, they weren't looking out after him. No, they, they wanted something to accuse him of. That's why they were watching him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers, these are doctors of the law, spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. In other words, they kept quiet. And he took him and healed him and let him go. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? Good question. So basically, he's telling them they're a bunch of hypocrites because, you know, you're more, you're more concerned about one of your animals than this guy that's got an infirmity? Really? Verse 6. And they could not answer him again to these things. Of course not. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden. In other words, they're invited. When he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place. In other words, you're sitting in this man's seat, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he, uh, when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. That means to be brought down. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Verse 12. Then said he also to them that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. You know, you know how it is. You invite friends over, and you, you know, have dinner, uh, have them over for dinner. Well, they're going to reciprocate. They're going to invite you for dinner. What's your reward? Well, having dinner with them, right? But Jesus says, But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. You know, they can't pay you back. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Do you know that there's two resurrections? There's the resurrection of the just, and there's the resurrection of the unjust. You don't want to go there. Now let's take a look at a parallel verse. We're going to go back to Luke 14. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, 
Ah, now if there's holy angels, then there has to be unholy angels, Satan. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least, the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Do you know when, well, I believe that when God created the heaven and the earth, there wasn't there wasn't a hell. I, well, I could be wrong, but it says here that the everlasting fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. I'm kind of of the opinion that uh, hell was created after the fall of Satan from heaven. I don't know. So, those on the left. Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was and hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord... When saw we thee, and hungered, or thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to me, uh, that you did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Back to Luke 14. Oh, let's see. So, when you have a dinner, invite those people that can't help, you know, repay you back, right? All right, Luke chapter 14. And verse 14, And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto them, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto them, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. Now, I believe this is talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's my opinion. And sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, 
I've, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. He wanted the things of this world. 19. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Verse 20. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Oh yeah, it's, it's our wedding night. We're going to have fun on the honeymoon. Yep, you want the things of the flesh not the things of God, right? Verse 21. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Now, I believe this has got a double meaning. I believe... Now, in Jeremiah verse th chapter 3 and verse 8, God divorced Israel, but God didn't divorce Judah. There were two different kingdoms, different kings, different land areas, different people. I believe that the one that wanted the land, the wife, the yoke of oxen, I believe that this is representative of Judah. But, he says, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Didn't Jesus say he came to preach the gospel to the poor? That he brought sight to the blind? To heal the brokenhearted? I'm paraphrasing, but yeah. I believe that this is representative of Israel. Verse 22. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. You know, a lot of those of true Judah rejected Christ and his gift. But divorced Israel, they accepted the gift. That none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate, hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, is Jesus really saying to hate your parents and your children and your family and your sisters. I mean, come on. The Bible clearly says to honor thy mother and thy father. I mean, come on. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, is he telling you really to hate your family? No. But he says, yea, and his own life. You're supposed to hate your own life. And his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. Remember, he says, love not the world. Love not the world. All right, 1 John 2.15, love not the world. Neither th the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Oh, yeah. So that's what I think they're talking about. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother 
and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Do you hate your life in this world? Well, you can't be his disciple if you don't hate your, well, this world, right? And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now listen carefully. Verse 28, Luke 14, 28. For which of you intending to build a tower? All right, let's make that modern translation. Uh, how about a house? You want to build a house. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost? Ah, that's where the name of this uh, Bible studies comes from. Counting the cost. He sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it. Lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Huh. I mean, really. You know, that's the problem with people. They want eternal life. They want forgiveness of sins. But they don't count the cost of following Jesus and discipleship. I mean, it's going to cost you in this world. Trust me. I know. All right, let's go to verse 31. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. In other words, you send an ambassador and say, you know, hey, we really don't want to fight you. What do you want? So likewise, all, uh, so likewise, whosoever be, he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? Yeah, if, if salt doesn't taste like salt and it's lost its flavor, what good is it? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Basically, that's wealth, right? Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Raiment's clothing, people. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Now that doesn't mean that you should sleep till noon every day and think that God's going to bless your farm. No. I mean, he might bless your farm, but you know what? You got to get up. You got to plant the seed. You got to depend on the Lord to give you rain in due season and pray for the harvest. I mean, that's, that's how it works. I mean, yeah, I would love to uh, sleep to noon every day and uh, go to the mailbox and Lord sent me a check, you know, that would be great, but that's not exactly how it works. God doesn't like uh, slothfulness, I guess you could say. So, 
Let's read the works of Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 1. You know, every I, I keep hearing all the time, oh, Paul was a false apostle. Well, you know what? Paul always preached Jesus. Paul never preached how great he was. So let's hear what Paul has to say to Timothy in chapter 6 and verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit these things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, Paul was always telling us to listen to the words of Jesus Christ, not his words. Paul always lifted up Jesus, you know, the guy that sent him. Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. So if a man teaches otherwise, verse 4, he is proud, knowing nothing, but dotting about questions and strifes of words. You ever seen people ask stupid questions and argue about what words mean? Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. You ever seen people say, well, I'm rich because God has blessed me. Really? You know, <laughs> Jesus, and I know I did it in the last study I did, but, you know, Jesus said that uh, it's easier for a Camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go into heaven. Why? Because they love their money more than they love the Lord. But there are people that believe that getting, gaining money is proof of godliness. Uh, word of faith, people, any, anyone? Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You know something else God hates? Murmuring. I mean, when Israel was in the desert under Moses, after they left Egypt in slavery, they began to complain about the manna. First of all, they're hungry. God gives them manna. And then after a while, they're like, Man, I am so tired of eating this manna. Manna for breakfast. Manna for lunch. Manna for dinner. I mean, seven days a week, midnight snack, manna, 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 manna. I'm sick of manna. Boy, I tell you what, you want to make God angry? Huh, that's, that's how you do it. Start complaining and murmuring at the things God gives you. But godliness with contentment is great gain, spiritually a gaining. Verse 7, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Now, people, I was a volunteer chaplain at the South Florida Veterans Cemetery. You know, I consider that an honor. And I'll tell you what, I never saw a casket with a trailer hitched up behind it when they buried it. I actually had people get mad at me because I preached a salvation message. I didn't preach everybody goes to heaven. I always preached those in Christ. I always preached our sinful condition. I'm not an evangelist. I already know that. I'm a Bible teacher. And then people got mad because, oh, wait a minute, you, you, you preached. Well, 
you know, you hire somebody that says he's a Christian chaplain to, to talk at a funeral. What did you expect? And oh, by the way, I, I didn't, uh, I had no set fee. I told him, you know, they always ask, well, what do you charge? Well, not always, but some people would ask, what do you charge? I'd say, well, that's up to you. So some people thought I worked for the VA. I didn't. I was a volunteer. But uh, I don't do that anymore. So verse 7, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, food and clothing, people, and having food and raiment, let us be therefore content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. What's a snare? It's a trap. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. You know, I uh, always kind of, in some ways, I kind of admired uh, Elvis because from what I understand, he was a very, very uh, generous man when it came to his money. I mean, you know, he sees somebody with a flat tire and he would, uh, he'd actually get out of his car and help him change the tire. And this guy's rich. And, and, you know, there was a story about a maid that was late for work coming to him and because her car was old and it broken down and he bought her a new car. I mean, I worked in Memphis for a year or so, and I always, no matter who you talk to, they knew somebody that knew somebody that had a story about Elvis. He was very generous with his money. I mean, he'd go get a $2 sandwich and leave a $20 tip for the waitress, you know? But, uh, you know, when you got money, you're going to have women chasing after you. Uh, it's just the way it is. I've seen it many times. And I'll tell you what, I, I'm i kind of glad I don't have money because, you know, I couldn't imagine having beautiful women every single day. I mean, bunches of them just throwing themselves at you, you know, especially when I was young. I'd uh, oof, I'd have been in trouble. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, this applies to the, child, uh, the human race. Uh, you know, people say, well, Satan doesn't love money. Yeah, but the Bible mentions Satan, but Satan is not the, the subject of the Bible. The subject of the Bible are the children of Adam's race. Satan is mentioned, but he's not the subject of the Bible. So when they say, for the love of money is the root of all evil, they're talking about human, Adam, Adam, Adam kind. Because people, there's a lot of people that love money more than they love God. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, Love, patience, meekness. Yeah, that really sounds like Paul's a false apostle, don't it? Oh, yeah. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show 
who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be me, that they may, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Every time I read that, I think of evolution. Which some professing have erred concerning the faith, Grace be with thee. Amen. There you go. All right, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. Say that real fast 20 times. Sat by the seaside. And in Great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And no, we're not talking about a singer sowing machine. No. We're talking about a farmer sowing seeds into the ground, right? And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing, by hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceived. For this people's heart is wax gross. You see, in their hearts, they really don't want the things of God. And their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, Jesus is saying, the disciples, but blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. 
When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. But he that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation, this is trouble, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. You ever meet people like that? You tell them about the, the gospel of the kingdom and they receive it with joy and they're so happy. And then when trouble comes because of the gospel, Jesus Christ, they endure for a little while, but then they become offended. And then they, they say, I didn't sign up for this stuff. Why, why God, you know, I believe in God. He, he should make me rich in this life, right? You know, in Luke 7, 23, Jesus said, And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Yeah. So back to Matthew 13, verse 21. Yet hath he not root in himself, but endureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receiveth seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he become unfruitful but he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some and hundredfold and some sixty and some thirty there you go you know just because you believe, it's important. Bearing fruit is important. I mean, didn't Jesus say, you know, you know, did you feed feed me when I was hunger, hungry? Did you give me water when I was thirsty? Did you visit me when I was sick? You know. Now, works don't save you, but works are proof that you are saved. You know, an apple tree is going to produce apples. And if, a, if you got a piece of land and an apple tree that doesn't produce apples, what good is it? Cut it down. Turn it into the, you know, a fireplace. At least it can give you warmth in the winter, right? So tribulation means trouble. John 16.33 Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, trouble, right? In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Acts 14.22 Confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, 
them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. This is talking about us, people. You know, they'll, uh, you go to a demon nominational church, and they'll tell you, oh, well, this is those antichrists over in the Middle East. Uh, I don't think so. Verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. That's right. When we get condemned and accused, Guess what? You got somebody at the right hand of God making intercession for you. What's intercession? Well, let's say you're in a courtroom and you're charged with a crime and you got a lawyer fighting for you. <laughs> and people, a lawyer that actually is a friend that loves you, not some hireling that you hired out of a phone book, well, or off the internet nowadays, right? Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep, for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord." Yeah, that really sounds like uh, Paul's a false apostle, don't it? Oh, yeah. That's what they tell us. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. In other words, you're going to be tested. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Tribulation, people. Tribulation. You know, everybody will tell you, Oh, well, Paul... Paul changed the gospel. Paul changed the commandments. Uh, no, Jesus did. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. 2 John 1, 5. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I write a new commandment unto you, but that which we had from the beginning that we love one another. All right, let's take a look at the faith chapter. Hebrews chapter 11. I guess we're going to read the whole thing. Verse 1. 
Now, faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Did you know faith is a substance? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the world's were framed by the Word of God. Not uh, the Big Bang Theory, right? Well, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let the earth, and bang, there it was. Well, that's the Big Bang Theory I believe in. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he, being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. You know, it's very possible that Enoch's going to be one of the two witnesses that confronts the beast in the final days. The other one being Elijah. Verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Ah, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hmm, did you know God gives rewards? Verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. That's right. Abraham was told to go someplace. He had no idea where he was going, but verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And what city is that? That's going to be New Jerusalem, people. You can read about that in Revelation uh, 21 and 22, I believe. Maybe 20 also. Verse 11. Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. In other words, she was in menopause, people. She was past childbearing age. Because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky a multitude, and as a sand which is by the seashore innumerable. They're talking about the... Uh, promise that God made to Abraham here. In Genesis 15, 5, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Have you ever been out in the middle of nowhere, where there's no street lights around, and looked into the sky? There are millions of and upon millions of stars. 
Genesis 22, 17, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Uh, notice to the black Hebrews, have you ever possessed the gates of your enemies? Uh, there's only one group of people that have possessed the gates of the, his enemies. Verse uh, Genesis 26, verse 4. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Uh, what kind of blessing have the black Hebrews been? So, there you go. Back to Hebrews 11 and verse 12. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky a multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. That's right, they want the heavenly country. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. That's right, New Jerusalem. Yes, you can read about it in John, Revelation chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Revelation 21, 1. Revelation 21, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Ooh. Ooh. We're going to come back to this. All right. Uh, let's see. Hebrews eleven sixteen. But now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. He was ready to, uh, Abraham was ready to kill his son Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Do you know that when Joseph died, he told everybody, take my bones with you? Because he knows that in the resurrection, he wanted to be with the, re the children of Israel when he was resurrected, he didn't want to be in Egypt. Don't leave my bones in Egypt. Take them with you. Verse 23. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Oh, yeah. The Pharaoh, king of Egypt, commanded that all the male children of Israel, the Hebrews, were to be thrown into the Nile River. And guess what's in the Nile River? Crocodiles. 
Verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Do you know there's pleasure in sin for a season? Maybe just a lifetime. Verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. By faith, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, a saying to do, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. That's what we need today, people, somebody to turn to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. You know that happened in the Old Testament? Not just Christ. It happened in the Old Testament. A woman received her dead son raised back to life by a man, a God, a prophet. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Do you know there's a resurrection? And there's a better resurrection. So evidently, there are ranks I guess you could say, for those of you that were in the military, uh, there's ranks in heaven. A better resurrection. I don't know. Maybe some people will have wings. I don't know. That would be kind of cool, huh? Being able to fly around. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. Do you know that Kent Hovind spent around 10 years in prison? For preaching? Yeah. Kent Hovind. You want to learn something about uh, creation versus evolution? That's probably the one to listen to. Um, the old Kent Hovind, and, uh, I really respected that man greatly. Some of his new stuff's not as good. I don't know what they did to him in prison. But uh, still, I got respect for him. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. Do you know that Stephen was stoned? They were sawn asunder. According to legend, the prophet Isaiah was sawed, was, was cut in two with a saw. They were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute. You know what it means to be destitute? It means you got nothing but the clothes on your back. Being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in day dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. 
Wow. Let's go to Revelation 21 and let's close this baby out. Verse 1, Revelation 21, 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my God son. People, it don't get any better than that. Let me tell you something. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world, and that's Jesus who is the Christ. In his precious name, amen. This is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to them. In Jesus' name, amen.